We want to be as calm as possible. And number two, being calm allows you to do this. I can't tell you how many times I have had to read transcripts of my jury selection, which means I lost because there's a transcript. And I see an answer the juror gave, and I'm like, why didn't I follow up on this? What was I thinking? And it's because I wasn't listening. It's like I get my question out, and I got it out, thank God, and the juror's saying something, and I'm kind of distracted, and we're not listening. We have to be able to listen and listen to what they're saying. So number three, prepare and create a voir dire notebook. If you craft questions on issues that come up in a particular case, some of those issues may come up again. And you don't have to recreate the wheel all the time. Just start an electronic file on your computer and keep your questions. Understand when jury selection begins. It does not begin when you walk into the courtroom. The car you cut off driving to work could be your foreperson of the jury. The person that your client says a curse word in front of in the elevator could be juror number six. People are watching you from the time you get near the courthouse, and if your client's out of custody, you and your client need to understand that. A seating chart and a rating system. This is critical. It is great if you can have help, have somebody that can be there with you and take notes and help you talk about, are these jurors going to be good, bad, or indifferent? But sometimes you may have to do this on your own. And a rating system is critical because you can't write everything down. You have to be able to remind yourself what you thought about these jurors, uh, especially as you get older and you can't remember what people said after 30 minutes. Uh, so I have a very complicated rating system, plus, minus, zero. Plus, I like what they said, minus, I don't like what they said, and zero, I'm neutral about it. And at the end, if I have no other information, I at least have plus, minuses, and zeros on the issues I've been talking about to let me figure out what jurors can I keep and what jurors can I get rid of. Understand the challenge rules, because they're just different in every courtroom. And I'm not suggesting there's, there, there's all kinds of strategies you can use, depending on what the challenge rules are. Just make sure you understand them. And yes, your client can help during jury selection. Now, it's important to think about this. Make eye contact with the jury, but not homicidal maniac eye contact. <laughs> And so if you have these forms that are given out in some jurisdictions, and it may have like jurors, I don't know if it has their address or something on it, and you're representing a person charged with a home invasion, you probably don't want to hand your client the address of the jurors, right? Your client can do this. Put a seating chart in front of your client and ask for this help. Every time a juror talks, I want you to put an X in the box. Because what happens is you get to the end of voir dire and you're looking and now you're exercising your challenges and it's like, oh man, juror 20 didn't say anything. I didn't ask him anything and neither did the prosecutor, so now I'm just guessing. Your client can at least help you keep track of who has said something so that as you get to the end, you may identify, I gotta go to these two jurors to make sure I have an idea of what they say. Remember who's seated right behind you. If it's small courtrooms, the jurors may be seated right behind you and they may hear you when you say to your colleague, that juror sucks. Or they may see when you write a big X through a juror's name and that's the juror they've been having lunch with that week. Just understand who's around you as you're doing this. And since the government goes first, listen. We spend a whole lot of time trying to object to what the government's doing. They're arguing their case. They're doing this, they're doing that. Do you really think that the government can argue their case in jury selection in a way that's going to make a difference? Or do you think jurors are just sitting there going, yeah, if I hear overwhelming evidence of guilt, yeah, I'll vote guilty. What does that mean? So instead of objecting to what they're doing, how about we just listen to what the jurors are saying? And it may be that we get some really valuable information. We're not going to return to the safe haven jurors, jurors that have said things that we like. As soon as we identify them, we're leaving them forever. I've seen really young defense attorneys win cases on little more than an absolute true belief in innocence. Just a, a belief in the heart of hearts, this person didn't do it, and I'm going to convince these people somehow that he or she didn't do it. That's what we want to model. We do not want to be acting because it's going to come off as fake. If you've ever seen community theater, it's not very good. It's just not very good. <laughs> we don't want to be doing that in a courtroom. And no memorizing. I've worked with some brilliant, brilliant lawyers on like openings, closings. 
And there's some places that teach this. And that is what it is, but I don't agree with it. And it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, it does not allow for inspiration. It does not allow for me to see somebody nod their head and say, yeah, they're hearing what I'm saying right now. It doesn't allow for me to take someplace and go someplace new. I mean, how many of us in an opening or a closing all of a sudden thought of something new we had never thought about before, but it was gold. I mean, it was really gold, good stuff, right? That's not gonna happen if we write it out and memorize it. It's just not gonna happen. But this is the other thing. Unless you are a professional script writer, you don't account for breathing when you write something out. You write the way you think, not the way you speak, right? So script writers, if they're writing out a monologue or a longer you know, piece of where one person's speaking, they have to allow for breaths in there, for taking a pause, for the origination of thought, for thought to come to the person even though it's a script. That's a, that takes a long time to get to that place. I'm not saying don't prepare. We're going to prepare these things, but then we're going to be in the moment. We're not going to memorize it. It's just really not going to be as, as powerful. <clears throat> the next three things are things you've heard your entire career if you've gone to any sort of trial skills program anywhere, right? You want to use your voice. So it's a reminder. I know, but I can't. I mean, I've got an acting background. i got to at least talk about it a little bit. Rhythm. Value. Right? Intensity. Tone. You know, all these different things are interesting. They pull people in. When I keep reminding ourselves, if you're somebody who tends to be at one level, write some stuff in there, some notes about when I talk about this part, I want to make sure I bring my voice down, bring it down, and then I'm going to bring it back up. This is a technique I've done with some people that you could maybe get somebody to do it with you, right? Um, they're working on an opening. I might stand and watch them, and as they're doing the opening, I'll have them look at me, and I'll start with a five, which means neutral voice. Six, seven, eight, just to get a feel of what it feels like to have a, a rising level, right? And then bring it down to a two. It's very artificial. You probably don't want somebody standing behind the jury box giving you numbers because that's going to be really weird. But if you practice that a couple of times, it just starts to feel more natural. It'll just start to come to you and you'll find ways to be interesting. Movement. We don't want caged tigers rolling back and forth. It suggests weakness. It suggests that you're not on top of your stuff. I know it feels good just to keep moving back and forth, but really it's distracting. It's pulling away from everything we're trying to do, and it sure as heck is not helping any story you're telling. So we want to have movement that's purposeful. I'm going to give you some examples in a, in a little bit here about how we can use movement in a very purposeful way. For those of you, how many of you are stuck to the arm length of a podium roll? I am so sorry to hear that, but I'm so glad it's only a few of you. Anything I'm going to say, um, you, you can do, you just do it much smaller, right? So if I talk about movement, which I'm going to in a minute, and I talk about moving from here to there, you're gonna move from here talking about one thing to there. So that's just, usually there's some questions after that I try to anticipate and get that out there. So we wanna have movement because just standing still is not great, unless you're Matthew McConaughey giving a closing argument and a time to kill and you're good looking and there's a camera right in your face and somebody wrote it for you and you've got the tears and the voice and all that stuff. Most of us can't just stand still and look at a jury and be interesting. We want to have some movement. Gestures. How many people still have this issue where they're up in front of the jury and they don't know what to do with these things? Right? It's like, where'd they come from? I never had them before. All of a sudden, now I'm in front of a jury where they, they grew overnight. Right? What am I supposed to do with these things? To the best that you can, forget about them. Really, the more we can invest in what we're talking about, the more these will take, they'll take care of themselves. Same thing you experienced this morning in those exercises we were doing, right? We started to talk about different things. Our hands just start to take care of themselves. Most of you, I would hope, if you were sitting in a hospitality suite talking to somebody, wouldn't be thinking to yourself, I don't know what to do with my arms, right? They're, they're here, I don't know what to do with them, right? You just, you're more natural because you're more interested in what you're talking about than how you're appearing. Some of you, that may not be true. Principal commitment is a very interesting concept that says in persuasion that when people are asked to commit to something, they won't necessarily commit to something big, but they will commit to something small. Asking for a not guilty verdict from a jury right off the bat is probably too big. That's like asking them to put the big sign in front of their yard. So what do you do? You lead them down the golden path of commitment inch by inch, step by step. Will you agree to listen to this one witness talk about X. Yes, I will agree to that. We believe it's very important that you listen 
to us talk about the police officers' work that day and whether or not they found gunshot residue. Will you listen to that? Yes, I will. Good voir dire questions. You can do it in opening statement, even though they're not responding. You can certainly ask people to commit to things you might get objected to. Who cares? Move on. You've got the commitment, right? But once we commit them to little things, we can now move on to bigger things. And the principle of persuasion kicks in. Little things commit to bigger things. I'm committed to you to listen to your story. It's a lot easier for them to say not guilty down the road when you ask them to, because they've committed to us. By the way, prosecutors are exceptionally good at this. Do you know when they do it all the time to us? Will you obey the law? They've locked them in to a commitment. The cognitive dissonance there is all there. It's nice. There's no dissonance. I will obey the law. Will you do all the things that you... They've locked them in. They've got us right there. So we have to break back and recommit them to smaller things to take them along down the road. And sometimes it might even be, will you agree to follow the law, all the law, not just some of the law, right? It just depends. The point is, it's a principle that you should follow. I love the fact that we have foremans in our juries for the following reason. They can become my ally and my enemy intentionally and unintentionally. And here's the way I love to use the principle of the foreman. I invite them during closing argument to recognize that they will choose a foreman and that that informant is very important to be the guide to help facilitate what I want them to facilitate. So I invite them to choose a foreman, which they're going to do. I then use the word guide so that the foreman gets an idea of how to be, because remember, none of these people have probably ever been four foremans before or four persons before. This is the first experience. There's not a lot of instruction on what to do. There's a little bit, not a lot. And then this is what I like to say to them. Or, uh, and I like to say to the rest of us, are we the type of person, uh, excuse me, that simply choose to vote with everyone else? Or are we the type of person that likes to vote our own conscience? Now, I've done two things. I put the 11 against the one. This is what I want to do. I want to put the 11 against the one. And then I want to obligate the one, the foreman, to become the guardian of fairness. Because we know something, and that's this. 80% of the people will sit silent while 20% talk. That's a, 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 it's a, it's a principle of life, and it was done in jury studies and found to be very accurate. And about 4 out of 12 will make the decision because the other, the other 8 will follow along. And like we said at the very beginning, if we could put them all in quiet rooms, we'd get 12 different verdicts with 12 different reasons, which is why I like to say to people, your reasonable doubts are your personal reasons to doubt. But here's what I love to say to a jury, to a foreman and to the jury. One of you will be selected to be the leader and responsible director of discussions in the voting of this case. I love that. You're going to be the leader and responsible voting. You're challenging them. You'll be held to the highest standard to make sure that everyone gets a vote. Mr. Foreman, will you be willing to make sure that every person gets to talk? We all know that the more people talk, the crazier it gets back there, right? The more that talk, the better off we are. I get them going, right? And that's what we want the, the, the jury to do. And then we want to bring the other person in, other 11, and say to them, uh, Well, actually, I specify the case. You can read this later. But then I want to bring the other people and say, and you have a a unique responsibility, the other 11 of you, to not let that foreman push people around or to let anybody push other people around. You're inviting them to break up the groupthink process. And I like this because you're challenging the notions of groupthink. Groupthink is a principle that says when people get into a group, they come up with a decision that they wouldn't have otherwise come up with often. And by inviting the foreman to be the arbiter, and by challenge, and having people challenge them, you're going to hopefully be fostering greater discussion. Okay. Well, that's all the time I have. Um, I want to end by combining the, some principles. Um, and let's, let's use this one. This is kind of combining a mass, a mass of all the principles we talked about today. Together, when we began this trial, we, began, we agreed to search for truth together. And I promised that I would visit with witnesses to ask questions if the DA failed to ask all those fair questions, and not to ask if he didn't. And you remember, there were a couple times I didn't ask a single question because he'd done his job. 
but remember the times I didn't, and I had to stand up and ask those questions? We all agreed in those moments, I would ask and you would listen, and you did. And what we discovered was that snitch did state my client confessed. That's what the snitch said. I chose the word snitch, right? That's a chosen word, sounds dirty, the snitch. Stated my client confessed. I'm using that principle of now I'm going to but. But the question here today, ladies and gentlemen, is are you willing to attach your credibility to her credibility? Because that's what they're asking you to do. They're asking you to validate her credibility. This woman who is a fraudster, whose proven motive is to escape justice and punishment in exchange for a dubious testimony at jibber jabber. I, that's, that's, I, I love that, jibber jabber, right? That's because that's what it is, it's jibber jabber. And I finish it by saying, a woman who was facing 1,567 days in a 12 by 10 jail cell, but who discovered freedom by using her words and now takes walks daily on the wide expanses of the beach. And how did she do this? By doing what comes so naturally to a woman of her ilk. Looking at people, good people like you, right in the eyes and lying. All those principles just came together. They're all there. And isn't it a beautiful way to say, you piece of crap, <laughs> right? <laughs> you person of your ilk. All right.